It is a tremendous honor to be here celebrating 40th anniversary of Family Voice Australia. Uh, family is one of the uh, biggest um, force that has created uh, the Western civilization as we know it. And I'm looking at Australia not in terms of geography per se, but as a uh, extension of fruit of uh, what we call the West. So this is not an uh, ignoring the um, native Australians, uh, but for the purposes of this lecture by Australia, I do mean uh, that part of Commonwealth of Australia which sees itself as part of air of uh, Western civilization, particularly from England. And I want to uh, cover very briefly, quickly, uh, 16 points that Christianity has introduced to the West. The West became different from the rest of the world because of the Bible. And here are uh, 16 points that you see on screen. We will take a minute or two each with them and then focus perhaps on one or two today and several tomorrow that Christianity made the West a uniquely thinking civilization, a humane civilization, a just civilization where, which was government was not with men but with law, a monogamous civilization, a progressive, scientific, prosperous, civil, where there were institutions between the individual and the government which were free of government control, a literary civilization, an egalitarian civilization, uh, an optimistic civilization, a liberating civilization where people were set free, a tolerant and a heroic civilization. And uh, the Bible globalized these ideas in such a special way that even when these ideas were globalized, uh, each nation uh, became sovereign, like Australia became independent of uh, Britain. Now, if I may take one or two minutes each to expand these 16 points for now, just as an introduction, uh, eventually I'm hoping to turn these 16 into 16 part uh, television series, 90 minutes each. Christianity created a uniquely thinking civilization that cultivated the mind through the universities, through education, in search of truth, setting whole cultures, whole nations free from grip of myths and magic and mysticism. So while other civilizations were teaching myths and stories or magic or occult or mystical enlightenment by silencing the mind, emptying the mind. The West was uh, uniquely interested in uh, cultivating the mind as a means of knowing truth. This was mainly because the Bible taught that God is logos, he's not silence, he's not ignorance, but there is sense at the root of uh, creation uh, this was opposite of what Buddha said. Buddha rejected God, not the biblical God, but the Hindu gods and goddesses as myths. But since he rejected the idea of God, ultimate reality, he said, is ignorance or avidya. It's not that in the beginning is the word logos. The Greeks use the term logos for the spoken word as well as the word in the mind, which means the sense. Uh, but Buddha says that since there, are, there is no God, in the beginning there is silence, there is shunya, there is void, there is nothingness, there is ignorance, primeval ignorance which he called avidya. Everything has come out of this ignorance, including the human intellect is a product of ignorance. And therefore intellect cannot be a means of knowing truth. If you want to know truth, you have to empty your mind. That's what meditation is all about. 
uh, concentration is emptying your mind of all sense, all sounds, all thoughts, all, all images, and achieving that point of nothingness, which is the ultimate reality. So, uh, while uh, there were great Buddhist institutions, uh, monasteries, none of them grew into a university because they were <coughs> teaching how to kill your mind, how to kill the intellect. As Rajneesh, one of Indian gurus, used to say, intellect is the chief villain. So Christianity created a uniquely thinking civilization, and we may talk a little bit about it in a few minutes. Uh, Christianity created a uniquely humane civilization where the concept that human being is different than animals. You can keep animals in, on cages, you can keep them on leash, but no sex trafficker is allowed to keep a woman in cage. Uh, you're not enslaved because human beings are made in God's image and they have the dignity of being uh, image of God. They have unique rights. Every human being is so important that God came to this earth and Jesus Christ laid down his life for uh, every uh, wretched sinner. Therefore, if human beings are so special to God, then the states must exist to serve the individual. Individual doesn't exist for the state, but the state exists to for, for the individual for defense of his dignity and rights. So if presidents and kings and prime ministers and governors and military rulers uh, trample upon the dignity and rights of individuals, they can be sued, they can be fired, they can be thrown in jail, etc. This was a unique achievement you, as Malcolm Muggeridge, travel around the world in Africa and Asia, uh, he was surprised that he never saw St. Darwin's Hospital for dying destitute. And uh, he began to realize what Christianity had done and became a Christian himself. Now, Christianity created a uniquely moral civilization. And the theme, as you know today, is what good is Christianity? Uh, should Australia reject Christianity? And as you would uh, sense, what I'm saying in this lecture is that uh, Christianity, uh, if, you, if Australia rejects Christianity, it's rejecting its soul. It's rejecting the very force that made Australia what it became. As uh, a German uh, NGO, Transparency International, looks at corruption in different countries, the Corruption Perception Index, it finds every year that the Protestant nations, nations whose cultural roots are in the gospel, they are the least corrupt nations. Uh, in 2012, for example, Denmark, Finland, New Zealand were the least corrupt nations, number one. Australia was number seven. USA was number 19 with what had happened with the crash of Wall Street exposing how greed is now controlling uh, so much of American economy. And um, <clears throat> England is just like that. This was after the scandals of the news of the world where the journalists in England were bribing the highest police officers uh, who were responsible for Queen's security, prime minister's office, and the corruption that is t uh, spreading in Europe, uh, which is destroying that character. In spite of all of that, uh, when you look at corruption in China, it is 80, and Russia uh, and India was 94. Uh, Russia was 133. The corrupt nations are the poor nations because corruption takes a heavy toll on the economic life of a nation, uh, which um, I don't think we will have um, uh, time to pursue today. But uh, as Christianity is removed from culture, from education, from media, it is mocked. Uh, the nations are condemning themselves for corruption. Where, um, and and uh, Australia will begin to feel. Christianity is um, 
good because it created a uniquely just civilization where not men but laws, laws that have been discussed, debated, questioned, examined, they would rule. And not guns, not armies, not military. Military has the real power because they have the guns, they have the weapons. But might will be subject to right. This was a huge achievement. If you just look at Arab Spring, what's happening in Egypt today, what's happening in Tunisia today, where Arab Spring actually began. Uh, constitutions were written, free and fair elections were held, uh, but the civilian elected democratic rulers within a year are removed by the military and military generals take over again. This has been the story of Pakistan, which became free from, uh, along with India in 1947, August 14, 15, that is now. Um, but in all of these years, the last government was the first government in 66, 67 years in Pakistan, which completed its five years term. Um, but that itself, uh, government was formed because of the martyrdom of Mrs. Benazir Bhutto who had become a believer herself in Jesus Christ before she went back uh, to run for parliament. Her, um, she had dictated in her uh, conversion story, which has not been released yet at the request of her husband uh, and uh, son, uh, but uh, it is a very well attested uh, thing with her personal testimony of why she had begun turned to Christ because she knew what Islam and what secularism uh, was doing in destroying nations, weakening nations. Um, but um, every time an election will be held in Pakistan and then military would take over. But to create a uh, society, a culture where what is right rules that whole I concept of just war, for example, comes from, begins from Revelation 19, that Jesus is the faithful rider on the white horse, uh, the word of God, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who wages war with justice. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 42, 61, that the Messiah would come and he would establish justice on earth. So that has been the vision of great nation as a nation where not power, not force, not uh, armies, but uh, just justice and law rule. Uh, Christianity is good because it created a monogamous civilization where sex was understood to be a super glue uniting a man and a woman in one family unit where children can be cared for now, the power of uh, that idea has not left uh, the West as yet. Uh, even if gay marriage is legalized tomorrow in Australia, uh, it's very difficult for atheists, secularists, those who ridicule the Word of God, those who ridicule Apostle Paul. They can't get away from Paul because they don't champion the right of a bisexual to marry a man and a woman. They still are bigots, they call us bigots, but actually they are bigots, uh, not recognizing that there are lots of people who are bisexuals. Uh, uh, you're happy with one wife or one husband. Uh, what if somebody wants four wives and or four husbands and his or her culture allows that, her religion, his religion allows that, uh, why do you impose that he should only marry one person? That's the impact of the Bible on the whole of Western civilization. So you can call yourself a Bible hater, uh, but um, you are still controlled by its influence. But uh, in my book, the book that made your world, how the Bible created uh, the soul of Western civilization, I have a chapter uh, which discusses the question, why did America surge ahead of Europe 
And I begin with uh, looking at uh, Alexis de Tocqueville's book, Democracy in America, in the second volume, he says to his French readers that in these books I have discussed a lot of things which are wonderful, great, amazing, extraordinary about America. And if you ask me what is the chief cause of uh, this extraordinary success and strength. Why is America becoming greater than Europe is basically the question he's raising. And he says that my answer is that it is due to the superiority of their women, meaning that American women are superior to French women and European women. Not genetically, of course he hadn't been to Australia so you can forgive him, <laughs> but uh, not genetically, but he says that because in America they have uh, applied the biblical idea of what marriage is more fully than any European country has. America has been unique in terms of being a nation where a president, if he lies about his private sex life, he can be impeached. A candidate, if he's found that he's been sleeping with a model, is out of the race. Uh, that doesn't happen in France. That's what he's saying. Uh, this empowers a woman. When uh, feminists have been saying that marriage is slavery, and I agree with them, that it is slavery for men. <laughs> that when you have uh, difficulty with, uh, with your wife, you're not allowed to take a second wife. You're not allowed to divorce because God hates divorce. You're not allowed to have a mistress. You're not allowed to covet your neighbor's wife or commit adultery. You're not even allowed to hate your wife because the word of God demands husbands love your wives. I've been married for 38 years and we've had lots of conflicts during these 38 years. And what this command means is that when I realize that we have, you know, I'm really angry, uh, but the Word of God says, husbands, love your wives. And I say, but Lord, look at the wife you gave me. <laughs> and then he says, no, 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 you don't look at the wife I gave you. You look at the wife I gave to my son. She was full of wrinkles and spots, dirty, ugly, and that's you. You are the bride that I gave to my son so that he might wash his bride with his blood to make her beautiful, clean, holy, and that's what you have to become, like me, like my son. That's why I've given you family, as Martin Luther said, that the family is the school of character. You know, when Luther got married, uh, all his brother monks, who he was a monk, a Catholic monk before, they began to condemn him that, oh, this is what Reformation is all about. He has given in to his carnal lusts, and got married, uh, so this is all about carnality, reformation. So he responded to them, you guys, you don't know what you're talking about. One year of marriage is more sanctifying than 10 years in monastery. <laughs> it's, it's your marriage that, which brings the worst out of you and then gives you an opportunity to deal with that worst with the help of your spouse, to have your character refined and sanctified. It means strong women. Women become stronger because they are secure that their husband isn't going to divorce and leave and take a second wife or have a mistress. That security enables her to fight for her dignity and fight for the rights of the children that don't sit in front of television with your sports magazine. You get involved with your children in their project, in their homework, etc. That's what builds the strong children, strong economy. The first day when I came to Australia last week uh, in Brisbane, I had several hours free. So I was just looking at uh, the, uh, what really happened in uh, Detroit in America, one of the largest cities in America that filed for bankruptcy. Uh, what, was, what were the issues behind that bankruptcy? And I found that 70% of the families in Detroit are single-parent families, 
and in many localities, 80% of the children are growing up in single parent family. And most single parent families don't pay taxes. They receive welfare. But the single mom is not able to discipline her kids. Therefore, in those localities, there is high crime rate. So the people who live there and are uh, trying to raise strong and good and disciplined children, they decide that we want to leave this place because this is not a safe environment for us. So the city's economy keeps going down because the productive uh, citizens um, keep going. Now, of course, the, the media is only talking about the unionization of the uh, automobile industries, and it's true that the unions have weakened the union between a husband and a wife. But the problem is not simply that the city like Detroit has gone bankrupt. In an earlier era, that city would have mobilized the unemployed young people who are right now in private militia. They would have become city's military and invaded the next city. That's why you used to have wall cities uh, for centuries, for thousands of years. But um, you, this, thankfully, Detroit can't do that. They can only hurt each other with little gangs. They, they can't create a citywide military. But what, happened to happen, what has happened to a city like Detroit is what's happening to the nation, the economic and military superpower such as United States of America. The federal debt of America is $16 trillion. But once you add the state debt, the corporate debts, and the individual debts, and uh, then you begin to look at the unfunded liabilities, which are huge. In Detroit, uh, they said that uh, we have, like police department said that we have three forces here. Two are retired, one is not retired, uh, but we have to pay for all three. The, first, the retired forces uh, have legal rights, so we can't fire them. The only force that we can fire, the police, that we can fire is the one which is on the job now. We can fire them. But that makes the crime situation even worse, makes the economic life of the city much worse. But the total uh, debt and unfunded liability of a nation such as America in the decades to come could be as much as $200 trillion. There's no way America can pay that debt. And what that means is a war. You know, when you look at uh, what caused the First World War, you read that a duke was assassinated in Serbia, and therefore the whole of Europe, most educated continent in the world, went mad and killed nine million people because a duke was assassinated in Serbia. No, it wasn't that simple as that. There were these economic interdependences, relationships, and uh, the need of nations to restructure global economy, which was behind uh, the mindlessness of those diabolical wars. And that is where this whole trend is going. The problem is that secularized universities have so uh, fragmented knowledge that the experts can only think of about, oh, we need to be tolerant and respect all lifestyles. They have no idea of what sex and family is really all about, ought to be all about, because there is no worldview, no big picture, which gives an organic sense of life. How is sex, love, marriage related to building strong women and strong children and strong families and strong economies and strong nation? What made America a great nation is what Alexis de Tocqueville is talking about. What made Australia a great nation? But those who claim to be wise become fools when they turn away from the word of God and they destroy the foundations of building strong women and strong children and strong economies. So Christianity is good because it created a unique civilization which built unique marriages. The idea that one man should marry one woman for all life in an exclusive relationship, this is not a Hindu idea. One of our gods, Krishna, had 16,000 wives, but none of his wives is worshipped. His mistress, consort, Radha, is worshipped. This is not a Muslim idea. 
that a one man should have one wife. This is not a Buddhist idea. This is not a secular idea. Plato didn't believe in marriage. Marx didn't believe in marriage. Freud didn't believe in marriage. Hugh Hefner certainly doesn't believe in marriage, even though he keeps getting married. Uh, but he is the one, the Playboy Empire, which has single-handedly demolished the institution of marriage as um, Martin Luther conceived of it and taught it the idea of marriage that you have had for the last 500 years, 450 years, is essentially Luther's idea of marriage because the Roman Catholic Church didn't have the same idea of marriage earlier. Uh, so the Roman Catholic Church celebrated um, virginity and looked down upon sex and marriage as something e evil, something carnal. The idea that sex is good, marriage is good, was a peculiarly Luther's exposition of the Bible, which became the modern idea of marriage, which was dismantled essentially by Hugh Hefner based on uh, Kinsley report. He worked on that report and Freud and Darwin, etc. But let's move on that Christianity created a peculiar civilization which was uniquely progressive. Buddhist monk and Christian monks had a problem in common. They needed to eat bread, they needed their wheat ground, and they didn't have any wives who could sit and grind their wheat. Uh, Buddha solved the problem quite simply. He said that his monks must go out and beg. So they would come to my wife and say, please give me bread. She has to grind the wheat and made, make bread from them, for them. But the New Testament demanded that whoever doesn't work shouldn't eat. So Christian monks had to work in order to eat. They couldn't go out begging. But they hadn't come to monastery in order to make uh, grind wheat and uh, bake bread. They had come to study, to pray, to learn, to meditate. So they began to cultivate their minds and use their minds to dam water, have the water rotate these wheels which ran their power machinery which they began to invent. And once they developed a machinery to grind their own wheat, they would grind the wheat for the entire village or the villages around them so that women can be freed from the drudgery of toil and labor. Because the Bible told them that God is not a meditator, he is a worker. He works for six days, rests on the seventh. Therefore, to work is godliness. But toil is a curse. It came as a result of sin. 